One of the things that I love the most about Christianity is that uh, it infuses meaning into sometimes what we might consider to be the everyday parts of life, even uh, monotonous parts of life. And that <clears throat> because God has created all things, all things that are good, um, when we partake in those good things, there's always something deeper. There's a, there's a way that we can enjoy it. You know, some people uh, who, who would reject God and they say, I, I just I love our world and I enjoy being out in nature and doing those things. But I'm of the judgment that there is no one who can actually enjoy this world more than a Christian. No one can truly appreciate what it means to be on the water. No one can truly appreciate what it means to be on a mountain until they have a relationship with the one who built it. It transforms and it changes everything, every part of our life. It infuses meaning into it. And so this morning, <clears throat> here in just a little bit, we're going to have a fish fry. And so I thought maybe we might look at Jesus and his usage of fish. Fish are a hot commodity in my house. If you're a goldfish, you can't survive. If you are a goldfish cracker, you're going to be eaten. So fish still remain an important part uh, of the world, especially in my house anyway. So there are four areas when we look at the New Testament and Jesus' use of fish. And I want us to, or at least they can be categorized into these four areas. And I want us to think about them. And then as we go and we actually hold a fish to eat it, draw ourselves back to how Jesus used it and infuse meaning and to just not just eating but infuse some meaning into it okay so let's begin number one he first of all and I think the most obvious one if you were to think about Jesus's use of fish the most obvious one would probably be when he chose to serve the multitudes who were following him right Matthew chapter 14 being the first one the feeding of the multitude so go over there in Matthew 14 verses 13 through 21 and Jesus will <clears throat> show us what he does in service to the crowd following him. In chapter 4, verse 13, it's, or 14 and verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. What he had heard was that John the Baptist had been killed. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot and in towns. And he went ashore, uh, he, went ashore he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. Now compassion is, it's an interesting word um, the, the Greek term is splagizomai. It, it kind of sounds ugly. And that's because it describes the inward movings of bowels. That's why the old King James would translate things like in 1 John uh, chapter 3, if anyone shuts up his bowels of compassion from him. They believe that feelings rested in the middle of your stomach. Because many times when you're afraid or when you hear terrible news, what happens to your stomach? There's like a pit in it. It just kind of drops and so Jesus felt compassion for them. He was moved in his inner being for them. Okay? And what's interesting is, I had a friend a, a couple of years ago in a place I was preaching, and he was teaching a class doing specific word studies in the Old Testament and New Testament. And one of the things he discovered as he discussed and studied compassion was that compassion up until the New Testament letters was a characteristic solely given to God. It's not until you get to the epistles in New Testament Christianity, for an example, in Colossians, where God calls on his people to be compassionate, to imitate him. And so here he is moved with compassion because he's got large crowds of people following him, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages to buy food for themselves. They have a legitimate concern. It's a large crowd, as we're going to see, 5,000 men. When you add women and children, you're looking at very easily a 10,000-person crowd. Okay? They don't have that kind of money. They don't have that, kind, that quantity of food to be able to feed them out in the middle of a desolate place, which is emphasized in this text two times. So, verse 16, but Jesus said, they need not go away. Give them something to eat. He said to them, we have only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring him here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And he took the five, taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. 
And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. Notice, they all just didn't get a little bit to hold them over. They ate until they were full, which in this culture was not something that is common. You see, you and I, if, you, if you've ever had this experience, now, I love to eat. I don't think that's any, um, I don't think that's any secret, all right? Um, you and I, though, have likely experienced this as Americans at some point where we eat something that is so good and we get so full and then they ask you, do you want dessert? And you really do want it, but you just can't. There are a lot of people in this world who will never know what that feeling is like. This culture was one of them. And so the fact that they ate until they were satisfied in a completely desolate place. Jesus was caring for them and serving them in a way that they never had been before. And then he took up 12, they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Why does he do this? Well, if you go down, the second he feeds a group of 4,000 men here in chapter 15, and we won't read the whole account because it's very similar. He's moved with compassion for the crowd again in verse 32. They have a few small fish. They ate and are satisfied, 37. They took up seven baskets full, and those who ate were about 4,000 men besides women and children. He's moved for them. But I want you to listen to what he says, why he has moved for him. Because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Now, financially speaking, the decision wouldn't have made any sense. As a matter of fact, on another occasion in John's gospel, the disciples say that. We don't have enough money to feed these people. We don't have enough money. You know, sometimes things aren't an issue of money. They're the right thing to do, and you just do it. You make it happen. And that's what he's doing here. He's serving this group of people, and he's not. And what we will learn from other accounts is that some of these people are only following him because he is feeding them. What's amazed me through the years is to watch some ministries where people feed those who are less fortunate, and they say, some people are taking advantage of that. So we should just stop doing it. So we should stop doing right because a small portion take advantage of the majority. But furthermore, Jesus knew they were taking advantage of him. And what did he do? He fed them anyway. And he called them to believe in him. He served them. He used this small amount of fish to serve large crowds. And what we have to keep in mind is, and when we partake and eat of this fish, we need to be reminded that we have an obligation to serve people. One of the scariest and most haunting texts in all the Bible for me is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When he calls... The people before him, he comes, he's set on his throne, he's got the sheep and the goats, and he, he says to those on the right hand, Come, you have been blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, because I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, and I was a stranger, and you took me in, and I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and you came into me. Jesus' love for people, especially the downtrodden people, the ones that we most likely avert our gaze from. Jesus was drawn to them. Think about this. If, you, if Jesus were to come in the flesh here and we were to go walking, let's say we go to Atlanta somewhere, and we go walking in downtown Atlanta, you and I would be uncomfortable with where Jesus went and with whom he would associate. Because he cares nothing for the elites in the sense of many of them have rejected him. Want nothing to do with him. They are sustained and cared for. The people he will go after are the people 
that no one cares about, that are actually really invisible in the eyes of others. Jesus calls on us, and when we partake, especially of something like fish, something that he used while he was on earth to take care of people, to serve people, and to feed them, it reminds us of an obligation that we are to serve other people in that sense as well. But also, there is this second sense that we need to keep in mind. Listen, <clears throat> um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul talks about how some people are going to come along and they're going to forbid you to abstain from meats that... They're going to tell you you can't eat certain things along the way. And he says, but these are things that God has created for you to enjoy. I don't know about you, but I'm going to embrace that promise. It's okay to enjoy a meal, even though others may not have. You can't take care of everybody simultaneously. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a meal and understanding that that meal is a gift from God. But even more beautiful in my mind is Matthew 8 when you have a Gentile's faith being put on display and Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. Many people are going to come from the east and the west talking about Gentiles and they're going to sit down with and recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God and the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. One of the things that's interested me is that how <clears throat> in the New Testament, well Old Testament as well, but New Testament especially, Heaven is pictured as sitting around a banqueting table, communing with a meal. So when we sit down and we have a fish fry fellowship meal or whatever you want to call it, we can be reminded that one day this is going to happen on this gigantic scale. Where all the redeemed in all the ages are going to sit down together. And sit down before God and fellowship. So when we partake of fish, we need to remember how Jesus used them. He used them to serve, number one. Number two, he also used fish in order to teach. He used fish in order to teach. Two, two areas here. Number one, Matthew chapter 7. He taught about God's goodness when using fish. In the Sermon on the Mount, in this particular discussion... He is discussing prayer, and he says, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be open. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open. Now listen. Or which one of you, if he has a son, and he asks him for bread, will give him a stone? The stones in that region actually look like they're loaves of bread. He said, Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Well, obviously, the implied answer is no. You wouldn't do that. He says, if then, if you then who are evil, that is, you're sinful, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So how is he using the fish on this occasion? That if your son were to ask you for a fish, you wouldn't hand him a serpent, a poisonous snake, to eat. Here's what we have to understand, what he's trying to communicate. If I, as an earthly father, in all of my sinful flaws, can be good to my children, how much more is God good to us? God is not against you. God is not against me. What does Romans 8 say? If God be... For us, not against us, for us. He's for us. And he showed us that in the fact that he gave us his only son. And if he will give us his only son, there's nothing that he will not give to us. And so when Jesus is here using a fish, he's communicating to us the goodness of God. That God desires to do you good and to do me good. And as we sit and as we eat, to be reminded that God desires to do us good. Number two, staying in Matthew, going to chapter 13, he also describes, on the flip side of this, the judgment. This uh, little known parable at the end of a whole section of parables in Matthew 13, the parable of the fishnet, he says this. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into a sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into the containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, there's debate about exactly some of the nuances of this. Is he talking about judgment, judgment of the whole world or judgment that takes place in the church? I want to set that debate aside because the point I'm trying to make is that judgment is coming. And if the parable represents anything, it's that judgment is coming. Okay? We can discuss the other details at another occasion. And so he uses fish. The good fish are put away to be used. The bad fish are cast away. Okay? And so he uses these fish to show us that, listen, judgment is going to end one of two ways. Okay? There is no third option. And to be very frank, as Jesus was, there is heaven and there is hell, and there is no in-between. Every person living right now, every person in this room right now, we will live eternally in one of two places. Those are the only options that we have. And we can deny it, and we can put it in the back of our heads all we want to, but it won't change the fact that when we die, there are one of two destinations. And we have a choice about which destination we choose. You know, <clears throat> when you go, I can imagine if you're cooking fish on a large scale quantity, that a fish that doesn't taste so good is probably going to find its way in there somewhere along the way. You can't produce mass quantity without having something that's a little inferior somewhere along the way. Now, you see, a lot of people are expecting to be like that. They're expecting to live their lives how they want to, and they think that when God is gathering everybody in, he's just going to slip them in, and they're just going to slip in like a bad fish in the midst of all the good fish. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. The good will go one place. The bad will go another. Like it or not, judgment is coming. That same God that he used fish to illustrate his goodness, that same God will also judge us. And we have to decide, and he's left it to us to decide what it is that we want. Number three, he used, the, he used fish to confirm his identity. First of all, <clears throat> in, in Luke chapter 5 that was read for us a moment ago, he has... <clears throat> Simon out, and Simon has been fishing all night, can't catch anything, and he tells Jesus that. But I love what, what Peter says. He says, nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the net. Okay? It doesn't make any sense to us because we're professionals. We've been doing this all night, and we've caught nothing. But because you asked me to, I'll let it down. And, you know, there's something in that that all of us, myself first, need to learn. It doesn't necessarily matter what conventional wisdom says. It matters what Jesus says. And at his word, even if it doesn't make sense to anybody else, at his word, I'll let down the net. I'll do whatever he asks me to do. And they bring in this large haul of fish, so much that they call for their partners, and their boat begins to sink. And everyone is astonished by what happens. Peter is astonished. He's blown away. Peter realizes when he's in front of Jesus, he asks Jesus to leave. Because he realizes this Jesus is not some normal human being. This is God. And he realizes what all people realize when they realize they're in the presence of God. And that is that they are sinful people. Notice he didn't say depart from me because I'm afraid of your power. He said depart from me because I'm a sinful man. And then they end up leaving all and following him. Now what I love about that story is there's this word used, I think, in verse 10 when the people are reacting. It's a word that um, 
the people were amazed or astonished, depending on whatever your translation is, but the original word means they were held in stupefaction. It means they saw what was happening and they went, couldn't believe what they're seeing. He stunned them. So he uses fish to confirm his identity as the Son of God. But he also used it to confirm his resurrection. Look in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 42. He's appearing to the disciples, verse 36, and it says, And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Again, they don't, the concept of Jesus being resurrected to them is as hard for them to understand as it is for you and I to understand sometimes. Because what is one thing we know by experience? Dead people don't get up. Right? So, <clears throat> verse 38, he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for I, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you and I see. They think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, no, no, it's, it's not a ghost. I'm not a ghost. Look at my hands and my feet. Look at the scars that are there. Come and touch me and feel. What this is showing us, first of all, is that Jesus' resurrection wasn't some kind of a spiritual resurrection. Jesus' resurrection was a bodily resurrection. And that's why in Christianity, the Bible teaches a bodily resurrection from the dead. The body that you put in the ground of a person who dies, that body is going to stand back up. That's the only, the word resurrection just means to stand up again. That's all it means. And so Jesus is confirming his identity. They're struggling with it. In verse 40 he says, and he showed them his hands and his feet and they disbelieved for joy and were marveling. And so he said, have you anything to eat? Okay, Maybe you didn't believe me. Let me try this again. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Because what would a ghost do if he ate a fish? Where would it go? Right down to the floor. He's driving into their minds. It's me. My body is up. Give me a fish. And let me prove it to you. So he confirms his identity. So as we partake in <clears throat> and eat this fish, we can be reminded that Jesus really is the Son of God. Jesus really is the Son of God. And we really do have hope beyond this life. The resurrection is not some pie in the sky thing. And so many people, what's amazed me is that so many people have viewed Christianity as some kind of just that it's like fairy tale type stuff like it's not rooted in history somehow it is these are some of the most historically verifiable facts in all the world and i don't mean some historian that you can google i mean the real historians who have academic and journalistic standards for their research and there's a difference in the two Google is fine, but just remember, I can build a website in 30 minutes and call myself a doctor and convince people to believe me about something. You cannot do that with academic presses and legitimate sources. And there are people from all different walks of life who have examined this. You have investigators, you have lawyers, you have a number of different people who have all examined these facts about who Jesus is, the fact about his resurrection. And one of them, <clears throat> one of the leaders in Great Britain in the 20th century, one of the chief attorneys in Great Britain said that there is more evidence to prove that Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead than there is that Abraham Lincoln lived. Try that on for size. As surely as I hold that fish in my hand in just a minute is as surely as Jesus is alive and well and real.
And you know what it calls for? It calls for us to submit to him. You see, people say, well, okay, I'm willing to accept Jesus um, kind of as a, a good teacher, but not really the son of God. Well, here's the thing. You don't really get that choice. The way Jesus presents himself to you and to me, he does not give you that choice. Jesus presents himself in what is known as a truth claim. And in a truth claim, it's either true or false. Jesus did not leave middle ground. He said, I either am the Son of God, or I'm not. But so many people want to treat him. And even people who would say, yes, I'm a good Bible-believing Christian. I go to church, and, and you know, I'm, I'm involved somewhat, but, you know, not just one of those radical-type people. And, you know, um, <clears throat> they've kind of taken that third position. Yeah, I'm willing to acknowledge the fact that maybe he's the son of God, but I'm not willing to acknowledge it in the fullest sense of the term that if he is the son of God, there are implications to that. And the implication to that is this. He is the king of the world. And I can either bow my knee to him now, or I can bow my knee to him at the end of time. His identity demands a reaction of either rejecting him or submitting to him. There is no middle road. So as we partake, we need to remind ourselves and ask ourselves where we are. Then finally, <clears throat> and I got really nervous during class, Mitchell said, let's go to John 21, and I thought, oh, here we go. Um, because that's the last part here. But he didn't. We, we were going in two different directions. Um, so John chapter 21, he uses fish to restore Peter. You remember that Peter has denied Jesus three times in Matthew chapter 26, and verses 69 to 75. And now in John chapter 21, he meets with him on the shore of Galilee. And it, if you remember Luke chapter 5, this looks a lot like it. Because they're out there fishing, and Jesus says, do you have any fish? And they said, no, we've been out here all night, but we got really nothing. He says, throw your net on the other side, and they start hauling it in. And Peter immediately shoots up and says, it's Jesus. I can't see him, but I know it's him. Why? Because at the beginning of his ministry, what did Jesus do for Peter? Let down the net. He let down the net, and he brought in a catch he'd never had before. This is Jesus. He's back. Verse 9, it says, when they got to the land, everybody finally makes it ashore. Peter, of course, swims to the shore ahead of everybody. They had a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. Now one of the disciples said, who are you? Uh, excuse me, now none of the disciples I dare to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. That was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And then you have this wonderful conversation between Jesus and Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, you know that I love you. Second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? One thing you can say about Peter, you know, he gets a bad rap from so many different people. But the thing that always comes to my mind with Peter, as wrong as he could be about things, that man was passionately in love with Jesus. I mean, just loved him with every fiber of his being. And that ex I think to me that explains some of his brash behavior. He just wants to love him and display his love for him in any way he can. So over a meal of fish, 
Jesus talks to Peter. And the three times that he denies him, now the three times he reaffirms his love to him, he's restoring him to his place. He's restoring him. And maybe what it is that we need to think about as we partake of this together is consider the status of my relationship with God. If it were Jesus and I sitting down having this meal, what would Jesus talk to me about? What would Jesus say to me? Jesus will always say kind and and comforting things to help those areas of hurt, but Jesus will always, always tell the truth as well. So if Jesus sat across from me today and we began to eat fish, what would he say to me? See, that's one of the things, again, that you can love the most about Christianity. Because what to a lot of people is just sit down and stuff your face can become to a Christian a soul-transforming experience. If you think about it correctly. So when Jesus used fish, he used them to serve people, to teach people, to confirm who he was so that people could accept him and to restore people who had fallen away from him. And maybe this morning we're those who need to understand the service of Jesus on the cross for us. We need to understand and and submit to him and his identity as we listen to his teaching and become New Testament Christians, be obedient to the gospel of Christ with a penitent faith, confessing Christ to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Or maybe we're like Peter, this New Testament Christian that's just not cutting it. We've blown it. And... um, Maybe that's a private thing. Maybe that's a public thing. Either way, this is simply an opportunity for us to pray together and to let, uh, in a general way, not a specific way, a general way, let our struggles be known. And, uh, of course, this is not the only time for that. Um, My phone is always on. The elders' phones are always on. Um, And so if that's something we need to talk about at any time of the day, we can do that too. And so if we can help you at this occasion, we want to as we stand and sing this song.